you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. Today's episode is about the mysterious disappearance of Jason Landry when he was just 21 years old. Uh, it was December 13th, 2020. We see him here in this family photograph on the far right with his parents. It was his sister's wedding and his brother on the far left. So a very close-knit family they have never found out what happened to jason they don't know whether jason is dead or alive it is every uh, parent's worst nightmare so what did happen to jason well on december 13th 2020 jason was heading home at around uh, 10 55 in the evening he was going home for christmas uh, as I said, it was December 13th, 2020, a bitterly cold night in Texas, when it would appear that he took a wrong turning and he ended up on Salt Flat Road, um, a very lonely road near Lulling uh, in Texas, very wild, very desolate, poorly lit, very few houses, uh, lots of deer and even some coyote, coyotes. And he um, crashed his car. And uh, an off-duty fireman would find his car, he would contact the police, they would arrive and they were disturbed to find that Jason's wallet and phone were still in the vehicle and the vehicle was inoperable. Jason has never been seen since and as I said, uh, every parent's worst nightmare, they still don't have the answers as to what happened Jason. They don't know whether Jason is deceased is he still alive out there somewhere? Um, the answers have not been found. So it is a, a, a really anguishing and uh, traumatic experience for this family, you know, who are a very uh, close knit um, family. Here we see Jason with his father as a young boy. He's actually the youngest in his family and a very close-knit family, uh, as I mentioned. And here we see a very tender picture of Jason as a young boy. Uh, again, uh, well, a toddler, I should say, really, at this point, with his mother, a very tender photograph of the two of them. So here we see Jason, now a man, with his father, Kent, all smiles. Kent has had a very interesting life, actually. He qualified as a lawyer and he then went on to study. Uh, he practiced law for a while, but he then went on to study um, to become a pastor. And he's now a pastor with his own ministry, etc. And that church has been a huge source of comfort for him. Um, he does a lot of interviews and, you know, is tireless, um, as is the rest of his family, in their quest to find out what happened to Jason. There's a lovely podcast. It's called Unfound. Um, a really lovely man. Uh, and he is a brilliant man as well. He always does a really great job on various cases. But he interviews um, Kent. And it's a great interview. I highly recommend it because it gives... Um, you know, sort of the backstory to Kent's life, uh, Jason's life, um, as well as, you know, some really good details about the case. So do check that out. Um, it's well worth a, a listen. And here we see Jason uh, with his mother, all smiles. Um, as I said, a very close knit family, um, you know, and uh, as I said, every parent's worst nightmare to have a child. Uh, go missing um, at just age 21 and to have absolutely no answers, um, you know, three years later, 2023, it's as mysterious a disappearance, um, you know, as it ever was. Kent mentions in his Unfound podcast interview, which I highly recommend, that Jason was a really sociable guy. He loved people. He loved fun. Um, and I think you can see that in this photograph here. I think this photograph really kind of captures his personality. He looks like he would have been a really fun guy to hang out with. But most importantly, Kent said that he was a really good friend. Jason was also a really interesting man. He was studying um, sound technology at Austin State University. He wanted to be a sound engineer. 
So, you know, that's a really interesting um, area of study. So he seems like he was a really interesting guy as well. When Jason set off home uh, on the 13th of December in 2020, uh, it was a two and a half hour drive uh, from where he was living and, uh, you know, excited for Christmas, etc. Um, little did anybody realise that, you know, Jason would never reach home in time for Christmas. So it, it's very, very poignant. So this is the vehicle. We can see the back of it is pretty smashed up, um, some of the front and side as well. Um, Kent, when he actually reached the destination after the police had contacted him, said that, you know, several deer went in front of his car and a coyote as well. It, it's a very desolate road. So it's possible that something like that happened um, to Jason. Maybe he swerved to avoid an animal or he just overcorrected um, and lost control of the car. Uh, the police were pretty confident that a second vehicle wasn't involved. There was no, you know, there were no paint marks, etc. And uh, uh, Kent said that uh, the branches of a tree had actually broken the back window. So it looked like he hit a tree. The branches then, um, you know, uh, knocked out the back window. So for a 21 year old guy on a, you know, this desolate road in the dark, it's a pretty traumatic um, experience. I'm sure he was, you know, pretty shaken up, um, you know, just the shock alone. When the police arrived and saw the vehicle, um, obviously it was a red flag when they saw that Jason's phone and wallet was still in the car, you know, had he suffered a concussion perhaps? And then they would discover his backpack um, about 500 yards from the car. And then about 900 yards from the car, they would find all of his clothes in a small pile. It looked as if he had uh, stripped completely uh, bare. Um, in the backpack, they would find a small quantity of marijuana. Now, a lot of media coverage has almost tried to portray Jason as some kind of drug dealer or, you know, and that he had gone to this remote location to conduct some kind of, you know, drug deal. Um, well, there was a small quantity of marijuana. I mean, that is not uncommon for students to have some marijuana in a backpack. Um, I don't believe for a second that he was a drug dealer. Um, it's also been said that perhaps he went to this remote location to buy drugs. But again, I think if he was dealing with some dodgy characters, uh, you know, they would have taken the backpack. They would have taken the drugs. They would have taken his phone or his mobile, you know, as I said, his mobile phone or his wallet, which were still in the vehicle. Um, you know, I, I don't believe they would have walked away from the backpack and the drugs. I think that this was genuinely and most likely a missed turn. Um, and I, I really think that's really all there is uh, to this uh, scenario. So an off-duty um, fireman actually discovered the car. He contacted the police. The police arrived saw that Jason's phone and wallet were still in the car, uh, came across the backpack and the marijuana, um, and they contacted Jason's father. They traced, uh, you know, the details uh, through the vehicle registration, etc. And Ken made the journey down uh, to Salt uh, Flat Road. And um, when he got there, he was shocked at about four o'clock in the morning. The search was pretty much ended. There was an initial search conducted by police they found nothing but it would seem uh, odd that you know this man that's out there not you know clothed in this very desolate area and, and nobody was searching additionally uh, Kent found his son's clothing in the middle of the roadway it wasn't gathered up I mean he's you know a lawyer by trade originally practiced as a lawyer he knew the importance of you know preserving evidence and that was a shock and he actually started videotaping and one wonders, you know, had perhaps the search been more extended in that initial period where Jason's abandoned vehicle was found, uh, maybe with more people involved. I think there's a strong possibility Jason would have been found at that point. So as I mentioned, Kent is now at the scene four o'clock in the morning. He mentioned that as he was driving down this desolate road, you know, deer and even a coyote came out in front of him. So perhaps a possibility something similar happened to Jason uh, or he just overcorrected or got a shock at being on this sort of desolate road. Um, and, and Kent actually, when he arrived, started videotaping 
you know, the scene and the evidence because, uh, you know, so much evidence uh, wasn't being preserved. So now I'd like to get into the sort of four factors that I feel uh, are behind Jason's disappearance. On the surface, it would appear that Jason was a regular student driving home for Christmas. He took a wrong turning, crashed his vehicle. But I think that it was a build up of factors that really made Jason extremely vulnerable. And that first uh, factor, long before he ever crashed the car, was the mental health of students during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, all that year that, you know, Jason had been in college, he was pretty much confined to his room because of the pandemic. Um, you know, the campus was pretty much closed down. Lectures were online. Um, and we know that he was a very sociable guy. And we do know through friends, etc., family, that he was finding this isolation incredibly difficult. And in fact, there are a lot of academic studies, you know, that have been conducted on this very topic, the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of US college students. We know that Jason was a US uh, college student. And, you know, here is an example of one of those academic studies. So what did this study actually tell us? Well, uh, it told us that, um, you know, students were surveyed. You know, how were they feeling during the pandemic? And 60.8% uh, said that they were uh, feeling lonely. Um, you know, so. Um, more than 80%, uh, which is a very significant percentage, 83.8% reported an increase in at least one of these three symptoms, um, uh, anxiety, depression, and again, feeling of loneliness, over 80%. And we know that this was very much Jason's story. So Jason had already been very down and feeling very isolated. Um, in the run up to his disappearance because of, uh, you know, the more isolated life, secluded life that he was living during the pandemic. We know that youth suicide increased during the pandemic. This is a science news feature and it discusses research uh, that was conducted uh, whereby the researchers looked at statistics from the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm not saying that Jason committed suicide. I, I don't believe that to be the case at all. But just to give you an idea of how depressed uh, and isolated some young people felt during this period. And we do know that Jason was, you know, extremely down during this period. Uh, I don't believe he was suicidal, but certainly um, it was uh, a struggle. And friends did report that, you know, um, he was using marijuana more frequently than he would normally do um, and uh, you know so he was he was struggling a little bit with the isolation and again when the researchers looked at the statistics from the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention they found that there was a higher rate of suicide amongst males during the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly in young adults aged 18 to 24 years so um, again I don't feel that Jason was suicidal. He had a very loving family, lots of friends. Uh, he had everything to live for. He had just done his finals. But I think that this is just indicative of just, you know, how stressful this period was that people felt, you know, quite hopeless. Um, you know, we're human beings. We're not designed to be in lockdown mode all the time. And, you know, it was a very difficult period for many people, even for peer people, you know, with, uh, you know, who are not prone to depression or anxiety. Uh, you know, it was a very challenging uh, time. So the next factor in Jason's disappearance was his increased use of marijuana. Friends had reported that he was smoking more heavily in the lead up to his disappearance. Obviously, he was isolated. It's locked down, uh, you know, probably lonely, um, anxious, etc., missing, you know, company. And, um, you know, he was smoking more. And a lot of people have been really judgmental of Jason, you know, as if he's sort of like some hardened criminal or drug user or, you know, um, and he's a young guy. He's 21 uh, heading into his finals in this lockdown mode. He's a human being. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that 
he was doing what he could do to get by. But I do think that sometimes there are dangers to marijuana that just people might not appreciate. And there is a statistically higher risk of motor vehicle uh, crashes, uh, of motor vehicle crashes taking place. And of course, there's also uh, an elevated risk of having some mental health issues. And it might appear like a fairly sort of harmless, innocuous drug. Um, but this is well documented in the academic literature, etc. So I'm just going to talk about that for a minute. And here we see an academic study uh, on marijuana use and motor vehicle crashes. I have the link there in the uh, bottom. And you can see that it says that the crash risk appears, car crash risk, appears to increase progressively with the dose and frequency of marijuana use. And if you think about it, logically, it makes sense. You know, marijuana makes people feel very chilled, very relaxed. So your instincts, you know, are not sharp when you're driving a motor vehicle. Um, so it, it's, it's not a surprising link at all. Here's another academic paper, the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs. And we can see that in states uh, you know, where um, marijuana use was legalized, there was actually an increase in the number of car crashes and also in the severity of those uh, car crashes. So, um, you know, this is science. These are the facts. Um, and so, again, we see another risk factor for Jason. He's already depressed, which is a risk factor, uh, you know, maybe not severely depressed, but anxious, a little bit more isolated. He's just on his finals. He's sleep deprived. And, you know, his use of marijuana has increased. He could have smoked a, a, a joint earlier that day. His instincts not quite as sharp as they would have been, etc. And we can see the results of the academic study there in the Journal of Alcohol and Drugs that after marijuana use was legalized, there was a 6.5% uh, increase oh, almost immediately in the car crash rate. And I'm sure that will continue to climb. But we've also got to remember the mental health impact of marijuana. Um, and this is actually from the centers for uh, disease control and prevention. And it talks about marijuana use, especially frequently, um, you know, daily or nearly daily, which we know that uh, Jason was doing, there can be an increase in disorientation and sometimes unpleasant thoughts or feelings of anxiety and even paranoia. Um, so I don't believe that Jason was paranoid, but was he maybe a little sort of maybe disoriented uh, not as sharp as he would have been. He had also been doing finals. He was sleep deprived. He had already, you know, been through a, a tough semester with all the lockdowns, etc. So um, this is another factor to, to add to the mix. Even in mainstream news features, uh, media pieces, we're seeing a lot about marijuana being linked to mental health risks in young adults, uh, you know, and uh, Again, you know, if Jason had maybe smoked a joint earlier that day, maybe two joints, uh, you know, his instincts weren't as sharp. Perhaps when the accident happened, he wasn't maybe behaving as sort of logically as he might have. He could possibly also have been injured. So, um, you know, this is another factor to consider. So in that piece that I referenced there uh, from NBC News, it actually talks to a uh, New York uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Ryan Sultan, um, who says that, quote, of all the people I've diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, I can't think of a single one who wasn't positive for cannabis. Um, and Sultan is also an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia Irvin Medical Center and is sort of an expert in this area. So I'm not saying that, you know, I, I think Jason wasn't psychotic. I think Jason was obviously lonely during the lockdown. He was smoking more marijuana. He'd been studying very hard. He was sleep deprived. Um, and perhaps after the accident, you know, he was just slightly pushed over the edge uh, and just wasn't behaving as, you know, 
logically and rationally as uh, as he might normally have have done you know just with the stress of the accident etc so i've been looking at the factors that led uh, to you know or were present in the run up to jason's disappearance i've looked at you know the role of uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown um, and also the risk of uh, motor vehicle accidents uh, as a result of um, regular marijuana use. Um, so two big factors there and I've also discussed as well the impact of marijuana on young people's mental health. There, it, it is now known that you know it can have an impact on young people's mental health, even to a minor extent, like disorientation all the way through to, um, you know, full blown psychosis and beyond. Now, I don't believe that uh, Jason was psychotic in any way. He was heading home, all was going well that day. I think he missed his turning, but, you know, could he have just got, you know, really disoriented in the way, you know, that, um, it's described as a symptom of marijuana use that you know that you're more prone to disorientation uh, and then when the accident happened this disorientation uh, uh, elevated further but now I'd like to look at the possibility that Jason could have also just to add to all these factors that were already going on which made him very vulnerable in terms of you know something bad like this happening uh, you know but there's also the possibility that he could have had a medical uh, injury. So I'd like to look at that now. And I'd also like to talk also about just a little bit more about the psychological uh, uh, injury that he may have also, um, or symptoms maybe is a better way of putting it, that he may have also experienced. But before I get into, uh, you know, exploring as to whether Jason may have had a medical injury, I just want to mention that Kent, in a number of interviews, Jason's father has wondered why did Jason strip? And I actually just popped into um, Google, you know, stripping and crashing uh, just to see whether there are any other, uh, you know, stories about this out there. And I was actually staggered to find so many newspaper articles in which somebody crashes a car, a man or a woman, and, you know, the police are on the scene, etc. And they find that the driver has actually stripped off after the crash. So um, this is actually more common than Kent might realise. And I wondered, like, what is the mechanism behind this? Why would someone do that after a crash? And maybe it's just adrenaline, the shock adrenaline is pumping and um, this urge to just sort of free themselves of their clothing it, it just comes over the person after this traumatic event and here we see more stories in the newspaper media florida man's reaction to a car crash he strips down um quebec daycare bus bus crash driver stripped naked now in some of these cases substance use was involved as well in some you know there was no substance use uh, perhaps there was an element of this in Jason's story. It was the twofold sort of twofold reasons, if you like, for him stripping. One, maybe the adrenaline and the shock after the crash. Um, but also perhaps, you know, he had some mild symptoms from, you know, heavy marijuana use in, in the lead up to his disappearance, maybe just disorientation, confusion between what is real, what isn't real. The police did say that, you know, Jason had, you know, become very interested in sort of things to do with the third eye, you know, uh, the wild, you know, returning to nature, things like that. So perhaps just in that moment of stress, just the, the you know, extreme stress that he suffered after the crash, the line between reality um, and fantasy blurred somehow and he just was, you know, stripping off and, um somehow seeking comfort in nature in some way um you know it's just very hard to predict how the mind can react after you know a very shocking incident like that where you crashed in the middle of nowhere but we can see that it's not uncommon and i think it could be a mixture of um you know adrenaline and maybe um also uh linked to just sort of mild disorientation maybe due to you know, having used marijuana more excessively in the run up to his uh, disappearance. We do also have to consider that perhaps Jason suffered some kind of breakdown after he crashed the car. 
maybe it was just something that, you know, after the lockdowns, after studying for his exams, the sleep deprivation, he crashes his car, he's in the middle of nowhere, it won't start. And it just pushed him over the edge. And we do see here, you know, here's a piece in the New York Post, a manic episode led me to strip naked in Times Square. Or, you know, um, you know, we do have to consider this. I don't believe that Jason was mentally ill at all. I think he was a very sound mind. I think, you know, the most he was suffering from was a little bit of anxiety from being, you know, more isolated. But perhaps, you know, the car crash just pushed him that little bit further. And, you know, as I said, just, you know, he was more disorientated than he normally would have been in the line between reality and fantasy blurred. Um, and it, it was almost like a sort of small manic episode in a way that led him to uh, strip naked. It's just something to bear in mind. I mean, we all have those moments in life where, you know, something like that can just, you know, it can push somebody over over the edge. So it's 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 very sad. It must have been really stressful to be crashed in the middle of nowhere on freezing cold night in the pitch black. Um, you know, it, it it doesn't really bear thinking about. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that the police, you know, talk a lot about Jason's search history and he was interested in a lot of mystical things. Uh, but I mean, you know, if the police were to look at my search history, I, I'm interested in all sorts of things. You know, I'm always Googling weird and wonderful things. Um, I think sometimes there can be an over-reliance on, uh, you know, drilling into every single detail of somebody's search history and it might not necessarily have that much significance. Something else that I want to mention is the phenomenon of paradoxical undressing. So it's extremely cold and you would imagine that a person would want to keep on their clothing but quite the opposite happens. Uh, when people are experiencing hypothermia they actually get a, an instinct to remove their clothing. And uh, this is a very interesting case. It's Jamisha Monique Gilbert, um, and she also went missing after a car crash. Uh, she had been smoking marijuana. Uh, she was in a remote location, and she was also found to have removed her clothing. And um, when the death investigation took place, they were saying that they couldn't determine for sure whether the, uh, you know, stripping that uh, Jamisha did after the crash was due to the psychoactive um, effects of marijuana is, is how they word it or due to paradoxical undressing or perhaps there could have been a mixture of the two but this is actually a very similar case to Jason's. Jamisha went missing after uh, a car crash. She was found to have almost completely undressed. Um, it was a cold night etc but she was actually uh, found eventually but she had also been smoking marijuana and again here we see the link to car crashes here we see her car crashed um she was noticed to sort of get fairly kind of wild when she had smoked marijuana disoriented etc and she was actually found covered in scratches it would seem that when she took off her clothing she was cold and she had crawled into where lots of briars were and sadly she passed away now i actually did see kent say in an interview the unfound interview that they thought it unlikely that um Jason would have crawled into, you know, briars and bush, etc. But actually, uh, this case shows that this can happen, that when searching for warmth, uh, a person will overlook the scratches, etc. Or perhaps in that state of adrenaline, they might not even notice them to the same extent. So that perhaps is something to consider um, when, you know, people are out searching for Jason again, that, you know, this unlikely sort of briars and 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 this kind of you know bush etc it, it's potent it's potentially possible that if if poor jason has passed away his remains could be in this kind of um you know type of of, of bush and briar etc and again in the death investigation report we see here that it says that jamisha ran approximately two miles before she became entangled in a densely covered briar patch 
uh, where you know she sustained hundreds of abrasion wounds to her body and eventually succumbed to her injuries and mental state by lying down in the wooded areas and dying of hypothermia it's really really sad and the report does say that you know this doesn't have to happen to anybody else by releasing this report you know we hope that uh, local teenagers and young adults will understand that taking uh, or smoking marijuana can exacerbate mental health issues, etc., and make rational people act completely irrationally. And that's the thing. I don't think that Jason had any mental health issues other than a little bit of anxiety. But perhaps after the crash, perhaps, you know, he had been using marijuana more heavily in the lead up to his disappearance. It just made him act more irrationally. And it does go on to talk about a study that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience and a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School um, states that, you know, they have discovered brain abnormalities in young adults who are marijuana smokers and, you know, certain regions of the brain related to decision making, etc., are uh, affected. Something else that we do have to consider is that Jason could possibly have been, you know, suffering from a concussion. The fact that he left his mobile phone behind seems very unusual, left his wallet, uh, you know, perhaps he was, you know, quite seriously injured. Uh, this is from the uh, Mayo Clinic and the symptoms of concussion are things like headache, ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, etc. Other symptoms are confusion, brain fog, amnesia, dizziness, uh, delayed response to questions, temporary loss of consciousness, dazed appearance, forgetfulness, which again might explain why his phone was left and his wallet in the car. So we do also have to consider, you know, these are a lot of factors which made Jason very vulnerable. You know, the pandemic, the isolation, the increased marijuana use, the crash, uh, the lack of sleep prior to his finals. Uh, and he could also possibly, on top of all of this, have had some kind of a concussion, as well as all the shock and adrenaline after something like that uh, happens to you. Is it possible that, like Jamelia, he might have, you know, got a distance of about two miles? He could be in brush or briars in the attempt to keep warm, etc. And then we've got to also consider another form of medical injury could even be something like a brain hemorrhage, even a small brain hemorrhage. And here we see an article which talks about paradoxical undressing, somebody who's stripped after sustaining um, a, a subacronoid hemorrhage or just a, you know, a hemorrhage within the brain. And uh, they weren't even suffering from hypothermia, but it made them suddenly start to undress. So we just do have to consider that that is also a possibility. So the final factor that I'd like to discuss is the initial slow police response. We know that the first 72 hours are absolutely crucial. Um, here's a piece in ABC News. Uh, criminology experts are saying, you know, the first 72 hours are absolutely critical. And Jason Search got off to a slow start and he was very vulnerable. As I said, Kent arrived at about four in the morning and, you know, he was you know, literally, there was nothing happening at all. He he was shocked. So here we see a piece in The Guardian about uh, people who use cannabis and, you know, the stereotypes that go along with that, you know. And we do see in the uh, cam footage when the police arrive, they find the marijuana and you can almost sort of see it that they kind of like, mm, this is somebody who's high. They're, they're out there somewhere, they'll come back, you know, there's no sense of urgency. And I do think that this may have, you know, the stereotypes around cannabis users may have played into the sort of um, more lethargic, slower start to, you know, a really serious search for Jason. This is a very interesting study which looks at, you know, stigmas around cannabis use. Again, another academic study and it's in the Journal of Cannabis Research. And you can see here that even when, um, you know, people where the red arrow is there, um, people are using cannabis for medicinal purposes. The police can still have, you know, 
a suspicion of criminal activity, sometimes mothers who are using cannabis for medicinal purposes, the police can view them in a less positive light. So there's quite a lot of, you know, stigma around cannabis use, even with the police. I think we may have seen this play out in uh, the initial response to Jason's case. Now, they did contact his father. They did do an initial search, but I think that it was it didn't have the urgency, I think. And I do wonder if, you know, the fact that Jason had cannabis on him sort of diminished their sense of urgency about it. They just thought, oh, this is, you know, some kind of, you know, crazy cannabis user. And, you know, when in essence this was a vulnerable person, there was even, a, you know, a spot of blood found on Jason's underwear, probably from when he was trying to get out of the car. You know, he probably... Uh, caught the barbed wire but even still you know this could potentially have been an injured a seriously injured person so when you look at Jason's story you can just see all the different factors that played into making him this vulnerable person out in the middle of nowhere on that night December 13th you know there was COVID he had been increasing his use of cannabis he'd had a motor vehicle crash maybe he was possibly you know physically injured as well he had some sort of you know concussion etc or small bleed on the brain uh he was nude the police response you know they didn't seem to take it very seriously initially and then the stereotypes that play into somebody with covid and when you put all those factors together it was a heck of a lot uh you know for one person it was almost like you know all these factors converging to together until a body is found, all lines of inquiry have to be kept open. And I think that Jason's father and family have been really good on this front. His mother as well, you know, um, could somebody have come upon him on the road that night when he was in that vulnerable state? Or, you know, has he got amnesia and he's out there homeless somewhere? Until a body is found, I think it's really sensible to do this. And they've also been looking at phone records of people that might have been in close proximity to him on that night. Was there somebody else present, you know, or that came upon him on the road that night? So I think that's a very sensible thing to do until a body is found. And I think that when they're searching, they should also look at you know the briars and the bush that they might not anticipate that he would necessarily have been in there we know that from the case of Jamelia I think that if poor Jason turns up dead and there's obviously a strong possibility of that um you know I think that ultimately he was the victim of the COVID-19 pandemic I think that you know he maybe just wasn't as mentally sharp and as you know happy and bubbly as he normally was you know, who's taking a little bit more marijuana than he normally would have. Uh, the loneliness was a very real phenomenon for people, particularly in that age group all around the world. This was a very isolating time, particularly for young people. Can you imagine going through college and most of it is, you know, online, you're in isolation in your room. Um, you know, it's, it's um, a very lonely sort of experience jason's family loved jason dearly um you know and something that i think is so lovely is that they haven't judged him um you know the amount of judgment jason has received because he smoked marijuana at college you know he was a good guy i mean lots of students smoke marijuana at college uh even his own father who's a pastor you know doesn't judge him they don't care you know they did wonder was he out there somewhere feeling like he'd let them down he crashed the car you know and they just said look come back we love you if you're out there and you know we just want you home and I really do hope that this family gets the answers and the peace of mind uh, that they deserve and uh, you know um, I, I just send lots of good wishes their way these are the details about Jason. If you have any information, um, you know, uh, the answers are still being looked for. Um, you might have a piece of information and it could be significant. Thank you so much for watching um, this very sad case. I really do hope Jason's family, uh, you know, who love him so dearly, get the answers 
uh, that they're looking for. As I said, it's every parent's worst nightmare um, when a child doesn't come home. Thank you all for watching, for all your support. I really appreciate it. Every like, every comment, um, every new subscriber means the absolute world to me. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Do take care and all the very best.